Cube. At Big Data SV 2014 is brought to you by headline sponsors WAN Disco. We make Hadoop invincible. And Actian, accelerating Big Data 2.0. We're back. This is Dave Vellante of Wikibon, and this is SiliconANGLE's The Cube. We go out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. This is Big Data SV. We're running concurrently with the Stratacomp. We're here across the street uh, from the Santa Clara Convention Center. We're at the Hilton, so stop by and see us. And um, our good friends are here. David Richards, who's the CEO of Wendisco, and uh, Jagain Sandar, who is the CTO and Vice President of Engineering for the Big Data side of the business, which is the one that everybody's excited about. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome back. Good to see you again. Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here again, Dave. So we saw you last uh, October. We were at Big Data NYC. Um, give us the update. What's new for you guys? Well, we continue to make very good progress. I mean, today we announced a new product in our Hadoop stack, which is uh, nonstop HBase. And we've got a fantastic demo, which we'll be doing on the show this week, a live demo. And I think uh, Brett Rudenstein will be on the show uh, later this week doing a live demo for your viewers of showing a, a, a streaming Twitter feed taking servers down, putting servers back on. So we're continuing you know, to use our unique active-active replication technology that we've had now for the past six, 12 months in the Hadoop space for uh, HDFS. And we've now applied that on Jagain and his team have done an amazing job in applying that to HBase. Yeah, so well, the 2013, Jeff Kelly just came out with his big data report, the third big data report. And he, and he referenced the WinDisco nonstop name node in there as one of the key milestones f for the industry to really, you know, the active active technology, to really put forth that infrastructure uh, that CIOs need for, um, you know, make sure that they're comfortable, they're sleeping, they're going to put their mission critical applications on there. So, so that was a key milestone. Um, maybe, Jagain, you could talk a little bit about that and how it applies to HBase. Certainly. Um, so the nonstop HDFS product that we introduced last year is specifically for the file system. And what we've done is continue to build on top of that by approaching the next layer up, which is HBase, the database layer. Um, the little known secret there is that the region server of the HBase system is a very bad single point of failure. And we've solved that problem by applying our patented active-active replication and creating multiple active replicas of each region so that should a region server go down, services uninterrupted, you can continue to run your HBase applications without any interruption. So HBase is so sort of the de facto database for NoSQL database anyway for, for Hadoop. Um, and you know we have some experience with HBase. John Furrier, you know, has uh, has talked about it a lot. We we used HBase extensively, and obviously had some some challenges. Um, so what are you seeing, David, from the the customer base uh, in terms of how they're using HBase? I mean, we were using it for a, sort of a little side project, which has grown up. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of HBase adoption, and you know where do you guys fit? So. We're seeing a mix. Um, I'm thinking of one very large uh, company in the semiconductor space. We're about, what was it, you gained 30, 40% of their deployments are HDFS, and the That's rest true. are HBase for streaming based applications. So it's everything from stock feeds mm -hmm. through to doing, you know, full. We're doing an example with Twitter feed analysis. So it's those kind of streaming applications. I mean, HBase, of course, was designed after, after the Google product, uh, Big Table. And that's really what it's designed to do. So as Jigain said, we're, we've moved a layer above the file system. We're now into streaming real-time based applications. Yeah, and so you're right. So Google uses a big table. Um, Facebook is big HBase uh, consumer. So we use it at CrowdChat um, and, and have used it in the past. Uh, and so you know, we've expected it uh, to go mainstream, but there's a lot of competition in that NoSQL space. So do you see you guys knocking down sort of other you know, no SQL database types, or is it sort of, you know, coalescing around HBase? What, what can you tell us there? Well, I, I'd like to go a step up, actually, and let's, let's take a view of the whole market and what we're seeing. What's, I mean, I was, I was saying off air before we came on that we're seeing, I was with us, the CIO of one of uh, Europe's largest companies a couple of weeks ago, um, who you would never expect to be talking about doing whole, wholesale, large-scale, replacements within their data center of traditional technologies. And I know that some of the other vendors in the space are partnered with some of those traditional vendors, like Teradata, like Oracle, et cetera. We're not, so we can pretty much say what we want. And we're seeing 
a great desire from CIOs to do wholesale replacement of those traditional technologies, replace it with the lower cost, higher functionality. Lower cost is not enough, you need higher functionality as well. Products like Hadoop, and specifically Hadoop, so the desire certainly to have the NoSQL stuff with HBase and the HDFS products in one, pl in, from, from, in one place from one vendor is certainly there. Well, I want to ask you about that because, you know, I made an observation, I saw Jeff's report, you know, again, and, and it's sort of littered with the big whales, you know, <laughs> or, or sort of co-opting a lot of the space. And, and I say to myself, wow, are we sort of already reaching an e equilibrium where the guys disrupting the market are sort of being subsumed by the larger guys as a distribution channel? And you're, there's no question, and you alluded to it, you didn't say it directly, but I'll say it, there's, there's no question that um, it, it somewhat waters down the messaging that, you know, sort of, hey, we can do something 10x better, 10x cheaper, you know, and much, much faster. You're starting to you hear in the marketplace that's much more tempered. Well, we don't want to say that about whether it's Oracle or Teradata or IBM, whomever it is. You, you guys, it sounds like you see the world differently. You really, I mean, in the early days of big data, it was all about disruption. It was all about really changing the way in which organizations operate, making them data-centric. We still hear that, but you're hearing it tempered down. I wonder if you could comment on that and give us your point of view. So, analyzing the market, which is kind of your job, um, <laughs> is difficult. It's really tough, right? So one of the measures, and I was, I was at the Barclays Big Data Conference, which is a public company conference yesterday, and I was speaking at it. And one of the analysts sort of said, well, I'm looking at, you know, one of the proxies for big data may be uh, the disk manufacturers, the hard, hard drive manufacturers, and they're, they're up about 15%. So is data only growing at 15%? I don't think it is. I think what we're seeing in the early part of the market, and this is a classic adoption curve, right? So we're in the early part of the market. There's certainly a lot of divisional... To use the word POC, I think, is, is, doing, is doing the world an injustice. I think these are trials in production. I mean, we're doing something with a, with a hospital that's they're hoping to save people's lives, and I wouldn't want to tell you know, a patient in that hospital that this is a POC. <laughs> you know, we're, well, we're hoping we're going to keep you alive. We're kicking no. the tires. And see yeah, we're just going to press yeah. it and see if it works. No, this is, you know, these, are, these are real production environments. And I think that we're seeing, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, nothing's ever as fast as we all want it to be, but this is happening. It is going to happen. And, you know, those proxies are only really, I mean, the, the, the big whales that, that we're talking about in the marketplace, yeah, the market's dominated in the early, in the early phases with those companies, but we are going to see the likes of Hortonworks and Cloudera, et cetera, really come to the fore. And, you know, let's face it, you know, Splunk overtook yeah. uh, Teradata in market capitalization earlier this, uh, uh, you know, in the past six months. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because you certainly see Splunk, um, you know, Click Tech, uh, Tableau yep. are, are really disrupting, certainly on the visualization side for Tableau and, and Click Tech and Splunk, you know, in the core yep. IT space. And, and so we would expect that similar things would happen in sort of big data infrastructure uh, unless, you know, either they get taken out, you know, or big guys are able to convince their customers because they have such huge distribution channels and such a, you know, such inertia around their install bases that, oh yeah, we can get there too and let's make incremental, you know, 10% a year Im improvements. Yes, yeah, so, I, mean, I mean, this isn't new, right? It's called the innovator's dilemma. And, you, you know, those traditional vendors have a humongous problem. They've got shareholders that they have to appease. They can't fundamentally change their business models overnight and suddenly s support a product that's 10% of the price of theirs. That's, that's going to be pretty darn difficult. So I would expect, you know, in the same way that mainframe moved to three-tier client server, you know, I always, when I talk to customers, I go, you know, mainframe, three-tier client server, and then what? Well, the then what is big data. It's going to happen, it's going to happen at the same pace that three-tier client server overtook mainframe. Well, we agree with you. So uh, the premise that we've always used in this space is that the, the customers are going to create more value than the vendors. Yep. And when that happens, what's going to happen is huge disruption in the customer base by industry, and then... <laughs> you know, their competitors are going to become less competitive and they're going to have to come back to, you know, guys like you to, to hang on to that innovation or uh, tap into that innovation. Uh, but we're in that, you know, space right now where you sort of have this equilibrium. Uh, as I said, you're seeing a lot of partnerships announced. I mean, you guys are making announcements. You've got a fundamental, you know, innovation. You're solving a, a hard problem. Um, you know, frankly, we'd like to s see more of that. We'd like to see this area of the, the world, you know, maintain its, its aggression. How, so how was the Barclays uh, Big Data Conference? So, so what, was that up in San Francisco? Or? Yeah, it was. It was up in San Francisco. It was organized by the investment bank. They had, you know, everybody, you know, Mike Olson from Cloudera presented, um, Herb from Hortonworks presented, um, 
uh, John Schroeder uh, from Mapar was there. A whole bunch of th those kind of companies were there. I didn't s actually see any of the traditional vendors presenting. Oh, good. Data okay. So, yeah, so exactly. it really was a pure play sort of big data conference, not a. It, it really was. And, and what we're seeing, by the way, and what I expect to see without disclosing anything, I would expect to see companies that traditionally invest in public companies have to move down the stack and come to private companies to invest. I mean, amazing things are happening. You know, a bit like the Goldman Sachs deal with Facebook before they did the IPO. Mm -hmm. I would expect to see a whole bunch of deals like that where, they, where quite simply those big investment funds can't get exposure in the public markets. I mean, we're about it, to be quite frank, in the Hadoop space as a publicly traded company. I would expect to see those types of companies do massive investments you know, above venture but below public. And you know, when you start to see those deals, and some of the valuations that I expect to see coming out of those private investments in the non-public markets by public investors. I mean, the world's gone crazy, right? Right. But we are, I would expect to see those kind of deals happen in the next few I, weeks. I got a question from a journalist today asking me, are we in a, in a, are we in a bubble? And why or why not? Um, and, and why does that matter? And I said, it's not a broad-based bubble, but there are pockets that are, yeah. that are kind of bubblicious. You know, what's, <laughs> <laughs> what's your take on, on that? I mean, you've certainly, you know, benefited from the excitement around, around big data. You know, the, uh, uh, investors are, are very uh, uh, interested and intrigued and excited about the big data side of your business. Are we in a bubble? I think, as you said, in certain sectors we are. But when I, you know, to, to allude back to what's, what I think is going to happen in the big data space, we ain't seen nothing yet. This is just the beginning of a fundamental shift, a tectonic shift in the marketplace. Is every company going to win that comes with the, with the word big data alongside their name? No. Are there going to be, you know, is there going to be a change in, the, in order as we move from mainframe to three-tier client server? We saw companies like Oracle, like EMC, like Intel for Chips be born. I would expect to see those fundamental shifts in the marketplace. So I've got to ask you, so UK-based company, you guys got to report finances once every decade, I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> so no, you, I think you're, you're, you're coming up to another reporting season, right? Shortly, is that right? Yeah. Mid, you uh, announced when you're reporting? Uh, late March. We'd, late we'd, March, okay. We'd so I know your, your colleague, um, uh, Richard Branson at Davos, was saying, no, it's, it works in, in, the, in the UK. <laughs> once, twice a year is good. Silicon Valley, you know, Americans, four times a year, it's, 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 it's too often because it takes your eye off the strategic ball uh, and, and, and it focuses too much on short-term results. Um, I, I, I presume you agree with that because you don't want to have to report, you know, more frequently. It's somewhat onerous. But, but, but let's talk about that a little bit. That reporting cycle, four times a year versus two, two times a year, do you have an opinion on that? So I like reporting quarterly, actually believe it or not, and we do. So we do um, an update to the city, which is th the London Stock Exchange, every quarter, and that's voluntarily, because normally we'd only have to report every six months, but we do, we like doing quarterly reporting. Uh, we recently hired um, a new CFO, a guy called Paul Harrison, who is the CFO of Sage, one of the biggest software companies in the world that joined us, that wanted to be part of this big data wave. Um, so we're not scared of certainly doing quarterly reporting. We've got our eyes and certainly, you know, moving to different exchanges, moving up the charts, et cetera. Yeah, I know that. And you can get bits and pieces of information that, that you can't typically get from, yeah. you know, European companies. And I, I, I agree with you. I think it's actually helped U.S. companies. And yep. I've heard for decades that the short-term focus is bad. But you look at the dominance that U.S. tech companies have and say, how is that bad? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, we are a quarterly driven company. Mm -hmm. My sales team are very quarterly driven. I, do, I just do not think that's a bad discipline to get into. So, Jagain, what are some of the things that, that you're tracking um, from the technology side? What are th some of the things that excite you these days? So, um, HBase, as we've spoken about already, is front and center in our awareness. Um, we're seeing good adoption of nonstop Hadoop, which is our HDFS product. Particularly, the VAN edition for disaster recovery is very attractive to customers. There are no equivalent solutions out there. And we're easily able to show the flaws in existing hacks such as disk CP and uh, win on the basis of that. HBase is also very interesting because um, 
people make the mistaken assumption that it's the HBase master that's the single point of failure. Turns out that's not as, it is also a single point of failure, but it's the region server that really kills you. Applications will freeze, data is, is, is likely to be lost, so region server failure is a bigger problem than the HBase master, and at the lowest level, that's the harder problem. Um, there are various open source efforts that are active standby. We don't believe in that. We always do active, active servers. And that's what our product does today. Let's talk that about that a little bit. We've talked about this a bit on the cube, but just kind of to refresh my memory. So you're talking about the HBase master versus the region server, and we've discussed recovery. That's the, always the, when something goes wrong, well, how do you get it back, and how do you know that there's you know, it's accurate, there's a single point of control. So in that world of HBase master and, and, and region server, how does that all work? How does recovery work without WAN disco, and how do you change that right. dynamic? So if you look at the region server, all current efforts are towards keeping standby servers, hot sometimes, cold sometimes. Cold meaning they have to read the edits logs and come up to speed and start serving content. That's a flawed approach in, in many ways. We have the ability to do coordination before data goes into the system. Therefore, we have exact replicas. This is not an eventual consistent system. This is exact replicas of the same content of the regions in multiple servers. And some of those servers can be in a different data center spread across the world. Um, that's our key value, and we've applied the same distributed coordination engine to solving this problem. So how's the, how does the conversation go, David, with your, your customers? So I presume you're going in at a fairly high level and talking about you know, sort of the, the, the need for whether it's you know, organizational change and you know, the, the potential of, of, of big data and the like. Um, and then, but you guys sell some pretty geeky stuff, right? So <laughs> you got a big spectrum of, of, of audience that you have to sell to. So I wonder if you could take us through sort of how that whole motion works. So in Q4, we announced two very important strategic partnerships to us, which were the two big boys in the Hadoop space, which are Cloudera and Hortonworks. So we go in behind the Cloudera and Hortonworks distribution. So both of the, both CDH4 and the CDH5 support um, our nonstop technology. We're certified against uh, CDH4.4. What I expect to be certified soon against CDH5 and HDP 2.0, 2.1. We're also, also modified to support our active, active replication technology. Our conversations typically happen with, at the CXO level, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a, a CIO say, okay, we're going to move to this Hadoop stuff. We're going to be able to do things that we've never been able to do before with data. I'm going to be able to query all of my data instantaneously across my entire organization. What happens if it goes down? And that's, that's when we get a call. I'm very fond of saying, well, I say to my VP of sales all the time, we sell Bibles, not religion. My goal is not to do religious conversion of the world to convince them to use Hadoop. I think Hortonworks, Cladder, and others are doing a fantastic job of doing that, and I think that's going to happen naturally. We want to go in behind and sell continuous availability, of which CIOs, by the way, already understand the importance of that. Now, th as for the geeky stuff, that's, that's interesting. I was in a meeting with one of the preeminent Silicon Valley companies last week, and uh, Jagain was doing, a, Jagain and Dr. Konstantin Schwazko were doing a presentation, and you should see the eyes of these guys light up. Uh -huh. They said, just a second, this is one virtual cluster that we can spread ac across the world? We said, yeah. But now, most people think that's impossible. Yeah, you, how'd you do that, right? I mean, <laughs> that, that gives, that, it gave me goosebumps just watching these guys go, really, that's one virtual cluster? Yeah, you can do that. That's well, interesting how you describe that, because I wrote down as you were talking, you're not evangelizing Hadoop, you're evangelizing quality Hadoop. Yes. And that's sort of the discussion that, that you're having. And, and, I, and I, you know, I don't, I, I don't claim to fully understand all the, the innards, but uh, my colleague David Floyer does, and we talk about this stuff all the time. We've been watching, you know, this market space for, for 20 plus years, 30 years even, and this is a hard problem that you're solving, and I can see why sort of the, the technorati get excited about it. So. Always a pleasure having you guys on. Thanks very much. Really appreciate uh, the insights and, uh, and the support. And uh, we'll see you around. We'll be watching. Right. Do you know, it's, you guys do a fantastic job. You really bring this conference to light. Um, it really is great watching you. I love watching the rest of the conference on, uh, on your Silicon Andal TV uh, shows. Thank you. Great. 
All right, appreciate it, guys. Uh, Thanks, keep it right Dave. there. We'll be right back with our next guest. This is Dave Vellante. We're live. This is The Cube. <laughs>